<laughs> Let's see if this is working. Anybody out there yet? I'm here. I can see myself. Can you see me? You can't hear me yet. Hmm. Is there anybody else who can't hear me? Hi, Jean. Hey, Bobby Joe. How you doing, Cheryl? All right. Pastor Borghart and his family are okay. Uh, there was a little bit of flooding in his office, though. Um, and so he, he is uh, still in the middle of, of cleanup and everything there. And so uh, y'all are going to slum it with me. I am Pastor Goodman, uh, associate pastor at... San Antonio, Mount Calvary Lutheran Church. <laughs> I'm glad. How's everybody doing today, other than Pastor Borghart and Thor, who are having a rough time? Good afternoon, Steve. All right. Well, I think we, uh, we should jump back in. Um, we are right in the middle of Genesis uh, chapter 44. Uh, Pastor Fanker left me at uh, verse 14, and we are kind of right in the middle of um, this, this sort of grand comedy of Joseph's. He is uh, misleading his brothers uh, as far as who he, who he is. Uh, he, he's, he, he's messing with them. Um, Today, uh, today we talk about it uh, this way. Uh, it, he, he's pranking them, um, <laughs> and um, I, I'd like to maybe just go ahead and start uh, reading uh, through uh, Genesis chapter forty-four and into sort of where this is leading, and then we'll we'll start to pick it apart because uh, depending on where you want to go with this, um, you you sort of end up in in two. Uh, big camps as to why in the world Joseph's messing with his brothers. Um, I don't know that it's that hard to figure out if you have siblings, but uh, let's let's dive in. We are in Genesis uh, chapter 44, picking up at verse 14. Again, I'm just going to read through to kind of give us a refresher of where we are, and then, then we'll get going. Uh, Genesis 44, beginning at verse 14 again. When Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house, he was still there, and they fell before him to the ground. And remember, this is just after Joseph planted his cup in Benjamin's bag and then sent the steward out to say, you guys stole from me. And they were all like, no, we would never do that. Uh, kill us if we stole from you. Uh, let, let the person who stole from you die, which was probably not a great opening line, but sure. Um, and, and well, Joseph knows what's going to happen. He's the one that, that put it there. Um, here we go. What software do I use for my mind maps? I use MindNode on a Mac. Um, it sort of helps me keep track of my ADHD. Um, it, it's a useful thing. Um, and, and yeah, I definitely recommend it. Um, so we are, uh, again, going through this. Uh, Joseph said to them, what deed is it that you have done? Do you not know that a man like me can indeed practice divination? He's messing with them. And Judah said, what shall we say to my Lord? What shall we speak or how can we clear ourselves? God has found out the guilt of your servants. Behold. We are my Lord's servants, both we and also he in whose hand the cup has been found. But he said, Far be it from me that I should do so. Only the man in whose hand the cup was found shall be my servant. But as for you, go up in peace to your father. Then Judah went up to him and said, O oh my Lord, please let your servant speak a word in my Lord's ears and let not your anger burn against your servant, for you are like Pharaoh himself. My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have you a father or a brother? And we said to my Lord, we have a father, an old man and a young brother, the child of his old age. His brother is dead and he alone is left of his mother's children and his father loves him. 
Then you said to your servants, Bring him down to me, that I may set my eyes upon him. And we said to my Lord, The boy cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. And then you said to your servants, Unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you shall not see my face again. So when we went back to your servant, my father, we told him the words of my Lord. And when our father said, Go again, buy us a little food, we said, We can't go down. If our youngest brother goes with us, then we will go down. For we cannot see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. And then your servant, my father, said to us, You know that my wife bore to me two sons. One left me, and I said, Surely he has been torn in pieces and I have never seen him since. If you take this one also from me, and harm happens to him, you will bring down my gray hairs in evil to Sheol. Now therefore, as soon as I come to your servant, my father and the boy is not with us, then, as his life is bound up in the boy's life, as soon as he sees that the boy is not with us, he will die, and your servants will bring down the gray hairs of your servant, our father, with sorrow to Sheol. For your servant became a pledge of safety for the boy to my father, saying, If I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father all my life. Now therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the boy as a servant to my Lord, and let the boy go back with his brothers. For how can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? I fear to see the evil that would find my father. And Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. He cried, Make everyone go out from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. He wept aloud so that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Pastor Borkhart, how you doing? All right. Um... I want to sort of go through this uh, this text, uh, and before we kind of get into it, because we, we sort of got to rehash uh, everything that had happened thus far in the middle of the famine that uh, struck the land of Egypt. Um, we, we know that... Um, that that's in the famine, uh, Joseph's brothers were sent to him to buy bread. Um, Joseph inquires after Benjamin back and forth and back and forth. And finally, uh, Israel allows uh, Benjamin to be sent. And now now we're in the middle of the, the, the prank. Um, my question to you is, do you think that Joseph still believes the dream that got all this thing started? Um, there should be an S there. I know how to type things, words. Do you think that Joseph still believes the dream? Because you remember, it, it was a dream that, that got this whole thing going in, in the first place, right? It, it, it was the, the dream that Joseph had where um, his brothers were bowing down to him in, in various ways that uh, eventually led them in, in their jealousy to throw him into the pit, to sell him into slavery, that led him to Potiphar's house, that, that uh, out of jail, uh, that, that led him to, to be the, the right-hand man to the Pharaoh, the, the servant of um, the king of Egypt. If Joseph doesn't believe this dream anymore, well then, everything that's happening right now he's learning on the fly. But here's the thing, if Joseph still believes in this dream, that his brothers would come to the point where they would bow down to him, that's going to sort of change what's going on. Let, let's kind of walk through this. Um, let's go to 44 verse 17, where Joseph uh, responds to his brothers. Joseph said, uh, far be it from me that I should do so. Only the man in whose cup in whose hand the cup was found shall be my servant. But as for you, go up in peace to your father. So Joseph is, is speaking to, to, um, to Judah and saying, look, I'm not going to keep you all as my servants, and I'm not going to kill the guy who uh, stole my cup. Stole my cup. Um, instead, I'm just going to keep him as my servant, and all of you will leave. See, if, if Joseph doesn't still remember his dream and, and believe in his dream, is he trying to keep Benjamin safe too? Because Benjamin is also the, the favored son, um, his, his, his son of old age, uh, the, the one that he adores. Um, if, if Joseph really believes that Benjamin is in danger now, because this is, again, a, a place where um, his brothers can betray a brother for their own gain and, and pretty well get away. Um, if Joseph doesn't believe that Benjamin is safe, um, he has to figure out what's going on. And so this is a test, what, what you see uh, Joseph doing. If he has no faith left in, in the dream that he had, um, well, he has to figure out whether or not they're, they're, they're honest, whether or, not they, they, they will, um, whether or not they will betray Benjamin, whether or not they will betray Joseph and, and their father all over again. Um, if, however, this is uh, Joseph 
believing the dreams of his brothers. Um, or excuse me, believing his own dream about his brothers. Uh, everything that you see, Joseph already knows how it's going to end. Have you thought about that? Like every single thing that, that's happening thus far, Joseph might not have any idea how this thing is getting from point A to point B. Like how in the world I'm getting from the pit where uh, I'm going to be... Uh, left to, to perish, to being sold into slavery, to being sent to Potiphar's, to being sent to jail, in, in all of it. Um, how is this working? I don't know, but I know how it ends. My brothers, whenever I see them, will come to the point where they are not my enemies, but they bow down. If Joseph really believes this, he's not necessarily testing them to see how they would react. He's testing them the way that God tests us. This isn't the way that we test each other because we don't actually know what's going on. But instead, he's allowing his brothers to come to the realization that the word of God is not only true, but good for them. Uh, Pastor Borkhart agrees with me, and so I must be on the right path. He remembers the dream, but he also remembers how he was treated. He wants his brother safe, but he also knows how it's going to end. Um, let's, let's go through this. Uh, remember when God tests us. God doesn't test us the same way uh, that, that we test each other. Um, we test each other to make sure that we know the right answer. Um, in other words, I test my confirmands to make sure that they've actually done their, their memory work. I, I ask my confirmands, what is the fifth commandment? I actually expect to figure out whether or not they were paying attention. You shall not murder, or is it you're going to mess up and tell me you shall not steal? If you shall not murder, you pass the test. But if he's God, when God tests us, does God know what we're going to do already? If God doesn't already know what we're going to do, um, well, he's a, not a great God. We should get a better one. Instead, when God tests us um, over and over again, he, he, he tests us so that we might see more about him. Uh, so you see it in, for example, uh, John 6 in the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, all of the crowds, remember, they're, they're storming over the hills. They're surrounding Jesus. They, they all want to hear him preach, and it's getting late. And, and Philip goes, get him out of here. I don't want to pick up the tab for dinner. We couldn't possibly feed all these people. And Jesus looks at him. Uh, let, let's, let's get the line. Uh, John 6, 6. No, not 65. John 6, 6. Where, do we buy, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. This isn't a test of Philip's faith, because in the feeding of the 5,000, Philip despairs. 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each one to get a little. Philip fails a test, but in the feeding of the 5,000, was it called the almost feeding of the 5,000, or, or were they actually fed? Uh, God doesn't test Philip to see whether or not Philip has enough faith so that everybody would get dinner. God tests Philip so that Philip would come to see just who his God is. And in this, this test, Philip comes to see the, the majesty of God. In the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus is messing with Philip. And, and it's, it's a wonderful thing. Um, understand that this, this prank going on with Joseph, it's, it's, it's a joyful comedy that God gets to, to sort of play with this. He, he sort of messes with us, uh, not out of... Um, not out of hatred, uh, not, not to, to hurt us, uh, but because his victory over the enemies, sin, death, and the power of the devil, is such a joy to him that he can't help but find happiness in it. And, and he can't help but, but um, play it out in, in a way that, that is, again, full of, of something resounding. Uh, and, and even as we experience these trials, something wonderful happens. God is not just sort of bored and having a good time at our expense, but even while he uses these tests um, to, to sort of play with us. Because, well, he knew how he was going to feed these people. Why is he messing with Philip? Well, 1 Peter 1 tell, 7 tells us that the trials test the genuineness of your faith. Uh, 1 Peter 1 7. Let's read that. Um, I'm going to go up a little bit. Here we go. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than the gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. See, as, as God tests us, he burns away every last idol that can't actually save. Every last thing is, is being burned up in the fire. And finally, at last, the, the only thing that exists, all the impurities are, are, are burned away and only the, the pure faith um, that, that it looks to God and God alone. And in this, um, even as God would, would test us, it, it's not just that he would mess with us. It, it's not just that he, he sort of enjoys driving us crazy, but it, it's that he finds a great joy when we finally come to that place when all we want to look at is 
like Pastor Fanker says, the forgiveness of sins and life everlasting in Christ Jesus our Lord. Finally, leave of me nothing but the cross. And then let me learn to start to test the same things. Uh, 1 Thessalonians, not 1 These 521, 1 Thessalonians. I, I spent a lot of time prepping this, huh? Um, test everything. Hold fast to what is good. In the same way that, that um, God has taught uh, us by testing us, we take that same answer that we have come to see about who God is, and then we go out into the world with it. Is this about Christ and him crucified? Is this in line with God's word? And even according to the, to the law, when, when uh, the world would tell us something is good and we'd say, I want to test this according to what my, my Lord has taught me about himself. Is mine a God who loves murder? Well, no, mine is a God who loves life. And so, therefore, my, my reaction to the things of this world that would break the fifth commandment, I should be against those things. Test everything and hold fast to what is good. Um, Luther, in this, uh, he, he comments on this. Joseph plays this comedy in a very kindly manner and leads his brothers to despair, destruction, and hell. And when all is lost, the element of comedy appears and scatters all dangers. Luther's a smart cookie. Um, in other words, Joseph, I gotta believe, actually knows where this ends because he holds fast to the dream that God gave him. He holds fast to the word of the Lord. The Lord promised him, you will come to a place where you will be the one that your brothers bow down toward. And he sees this whole thing ending this way. There is no way that this can end but that his brothers actually find comfort in him standing there. And so in all of it, um, he, he plays out this comedy, driving his brothers away from those things which cause so much harm in their family, so much angst, uh, even in their own hearts, because this is something that still torments them. I mean, how often is, is uh, even as uh, we, we sort of get the, the recounting to Joseph about Joseph, how, how often is Joseph's own supposed death a subtext to everything else that's going on? Joseph's supposed death by lions is, is the thing that, that still torments their brother's father, Joseph's um, sudden death is the thing that, that um, everybody sees when they first look at Benjamin. And that's actually got to be probably hard for him, right? Like if the very first thing that somebody sees in you is the loss of somebody else, there, there's something to your character that gets lost in that. Um, that that's got to make things a little bit difficult among the brothers. Uh, even just the guilt that, that is very clearly weighing uh, on the brothers and, and growing um, as time goes on, because that's the thing about guilt. Um, it, it never actually goes away. We, we just sort of try and run from it and try and hide it in corners, but it grows there. And, and so, so much more um, will this take over our lives that God would not see this happen. And he gives us, for example, confession and absolution, that we don't need to constantly run from guilt, but that we can take our guilt to the Lord and actually hear blessed words. In the stead and by the command of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Um, the, the subtext of, of all of this thing, um, Joseph knows where it ends. He believes st still the dream. And, and so even as he pushes his brothers closer and closer to just utter the brink of despair, um, no, you're, you're going to send, uh, you're going to go home without your brother Benjamin. I'm going to keep him. Whatever happens to your dad happens to your dad. He allows this to press on them. This is the working of the law. He's, he's confronting them with their own sins, um, not to leave them in their sins, but, but um, finally, uh, that the gospel would actually win the day. Um, that this is actually a comedy, not just because Joseph um, is, is enjoying messing with his brothers because they messed with him first. This, this is a comedy because um, at, at the very peak of um, Judah's despair, death becomes a joke. At the very peak of Judah's despair, no, take me instead, because if this goes out this way, not only will we have lost two brothers now, and both of it's my fault, um, but my dad's going to die too, and it's all going to be on me. Death is everywhere around me, and, and woe to me. Just take me instead. There is nothing else that I can do to excuse it. And, and have you noticed? Judah's not making excuses anymore. He's not talking about anything. He, he refuses, in fact, to, to be known by anything about what's happening. Um... Instead, he just sort of says, um, what shall we speak? How can we clear ourselves? This, Lord, have mercy on sinners. This has to be the, the ultimate confession. But here, here, um, Judah respond, or excuse me, Joseph responds, bro, it's a prank. There's a camera right over there. It's a prank. It's a prank. <laughs> he, he says, 
I am Judah, or I am Joseph. Um, and, and here, the whole thing becomes something to laugh at. The death um, of, of Joseph is now a joke um, because we have the victory over death and Joseph is alive. The loss of Benjamin now becomes a joke because Benjamin cannot be lost for he is bound to the promise of God. Uh, um, even, even Israel's uh, despair, it, it's a joke because the, the victory, the, the promise of life it is, is uh, such a, re a resounding joy that everything else is going on. Um, it, it finally comes back to this truth that they were told at the very beginning. And, and they should have known this all along. Joseph told them this in, in a dream. This is of the Lord you all will bow down to me. And they didn't believe him. But here's the thing. If his words were true, then Joseph can't be dead. And if his words were true, then not only can Joseph not be dead, but he also has to be working some sort of salvation. Um, this is where I think God actually finds a joy to, to prank us, uh, to, to, to mess with us, to, to have fun in reminding us of his salvation, even when we would constantly look to other things. Because that's the other side of it. Like, Joseph could be really mad at everything that's happened. And this is just nothing other than, than revenge. Um, do you think Israel laughed when he found out Joseph was alive? Doubtful. I don't know. Um, go to the prodigal son when he returned. Um, his father is pretty overjoyed. He, he runs and leaps at him. Uh, he, he starts running uh, when his father is still, or I mean when the, the son is still a long way off. He's overjoyed to have his son back. This is where um, the, the resurrection actually, actually wins the day. And, and if we want to carry this forward, um, well, I, I can say that there are those whom I have, I have loved and lost in painful ways. But in the resurrection, no, I, I won't be just downcast because they, they suffered through cancer and fell asleep in Christ. I'll laugh to see them run and dance and, and sing hymns with me in the victory. Um, I, I, I actually got to believe Israel laughed. I, I, I got to believe that, that he... he finally comes to see this. God, when we would turn away from his promises, never responds in anger and never responds in rubbing our nose in the dirt. Um, but instead, he, he calls us to him and he even has fun while he does it. If the brothers would have just believed, there would have been no joke to play. Even Israel heard the joke. Um, or I mean, Israel heard the, the dream. Um, God delights in this, though, in, in calling us to, to uh, repentance, in calling us to hope, in calling us to see life in him. And, and in all of it, we can finally say, why was I so afraid in the first place? Who is your Christ? Isn't he the one who conquered death? Why are you so afraid? Who is your God? Isn't he the one who has risen from the dead? When we, when we face these things, um, we, we have to go in with, with this joy. Um, Oh, absolutely. I know that, that yeah, this is, this is a tough pill to swallow. And of course, we wrestle with these things in doubt. Um, but, but the thing is, uh, when our God is working inside of all of it, he, he's, he's actually celebrating with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven when a sinner repents, which is sort of the verse, right? Um, that um, when, when that one singular sinner repents, all of, ange all of the angels rejoice, um, so much more than the 99 who need no repenting. Um, we, we want to remember um, that uh, this is, is God working mercy all the way through. This is always God working mercy, this, this test, this joke, this prank. It's always so that the brothers would be, again, further reminded about who their God is, how their God is, is working good. A and then um, when we start to see Joseph uh, being brought through this thing, um, again, he, he weeps many times throughout this. Like Joseph cries a lot, and Pastor Fanker mentioned that his mascara ran, uh, which I can't argue with. Um, but I, I think, though, if he truly does have faith in this dream, um, he, he weeps uh, over and over again, not just in a discovery that, that his brothers aren't the, the monsters that they used to be, but in the same way that, that all of heaven rejoices over that sinner who repents. Um, that that um, now, all of a sudden, you have Joseph, who's no longer just concerned about Benjamin, but he's actually celebrating the, the magnitude of the victory that is Christ's mercy um, actually being proclaimed, that, that faith is actually turning towards Christ, uh, that he even cares about the, these heathen brothers of his uh, that, that are apart from the promised line. Um, if mercy is driving this thing, um, it, it changes the prank. See, if, if you mess with somebody because you don't like them, at the end you'll be farther apart. But if you're messing with somebody because you like them, it actually drives you closer. It, it's like when um, any um, 
teenage boy wants to flirt with a girl that he likes. Um, he, he doesn't just go up to her and, and say the, the obvious thing, hey, you're pretty and I think you're smart and you're also a Lutheran like me, so, so maybe we should, uh, we, we should see if this thing's going to work out. I, instead, he messes with her. <laughs> He throws things at her. Um, Lord have mercy, we're, we're dumb. Um, but at the end of it, though, all of it, um, it, it's actually meant to drive people closer together. If when Joseph is looking at his brothers, if he looks at them in hatred, the point of all of this should be to get them farther away. But how does it end? See, they end up closer. When Joseph looks at his brothers, he looks at them in mercy because he knows and he believes. He, he sees them then um, not as his own enemies, uh, but according to the pain, um, or excuse me, not, not according to the pain what they have caused him, but according to the forgiveness of sins that God works, according to the mercy that, that um, God would have done through Joseph even to sinners. Because God doesn't work the mercy to the people who make good choices. God works mercy for the sinners, even the ones who would crucify him, even me, even you. If God would hold back mercy until all of us made good choices, uh, the resurrection would, would be an empty, empty place. Um, and so um, all of this then is going to be driven by, by mercy. And that mercy actually changes how we see everything else. Um, we, we are taught to pray this, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who, who trespass against us. Um, we're taught to be peacemakers. Matthew in the, the Sermon on the Mount uh, would have Jesus say, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they should be called children of God. Um, run this backwards, and it maybe makes a lot of sense. Um, the children of God are peacemakers, and so they are blessed. You are a child of God, which means you are somebody who has received mercy. You are taught to pray, forgive us our trespasses, because you know who your God is. Yours is the Jesus who died on the cross a long time before you ever thought to ask him, before you were even taught to ask him, forgive us our trespasses. He already forgave you because, well, before you called, he answered. Before you could ever ask, he died and rose from the dead. But he also teaches us to see our neighbor in light of that same sacrifice. Forgive us our trespasses from the cross as we forgive those who trespass against us, not from our hearts, but also from the cross. See, this isn't Joseph who is just somehow better than um, everybody else because he, he doesn't ever hurt in any of it. This is Joseph who actually sees his brothers as somebody loved by God. And so even though his heart might not have followed initially, he, he would hear the word of the Lord that, that would constantly drive him to hear, to, to receive the good news that Jesus even died for his enemies. Forgive us our trespasses from the only place that forgiveness comes from, the cross of Christ. And so let us see our enemies through that same cross of Christ, the only place forgiveness comes from, so that when our hearts have trouble with that word of forgiveness, we might start to look to Jesus for it instead of just within our hearts. This is where peacemaking actually comes from. We can set aside war. We can set aside strife. We can set aside debt and grudge and hate because we can see simply this. God died for you too. Children of God make peace, not based on ourselves, but based upon the Father's mercy. Um, in, in all of this, in all of this, we, we actually get to see the working of mercy that is so powerful that it actually becomes contagious. Um, because we, we see um, a, a picture that, that has already been played out once. Um, Joseph's brothers, out of raw and utter selfishness, despite what it would do to their father who loved Joseph, despite Joseph, cast them into the pit so that they could have something. Now they're given another opportunity. They could cast aside Benjamin and get away free with their lives, no longer sold to slavery, no longer indebted to death. It, it might not be great for Israel to hear more news. It might not be great for Benjamin, but they would be okay. They, they could get away if they give up Benjamin. But over and over again, the gospel is being not only preached, but enacted in front of them. And something happens. Um, everybody actually starts to want to deal in, in mercy. And so Judah actually puts himself then in a position where he says, take my life instead. It, it, it's, it, it's a sacrifice of self for neighbor instead of just a sacrifice of neighbor for self. God's mercy, God's gospel, is undoing what the law would point out in us as sin, as sinners. We as sinners will always sacrifice our neighbors for ourselves. That's what got this whole story going. But God would sacrifice himself for us. And this is then the new definition of love for Christians. 
we're the ones who see love as an action, uh, love as a sacrifice, where God died chiefly for us. So that when we look at each other, it, it's no longer than just about me. It, it's actually about you too. Um, and, and so love, greater love has nothing, no more than this, that one would lay down his life for his neighbor. Uh, Judah even here takes up the mantle uh, of the Christ type. It, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, and so finally, the, the, the prank uh, starts to uh, come to that point where, where Joseph can point at the camera and smile obnoxiously uh, for YouTube. Um, he, he says something uh, profound. Um, let's go to it. Joseph could not control himself because before all those who stood by him, and he cried, make everyone go out for me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud, so the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Brilliant. It's not just pointing at the camera and saying, bro, it's a prank, though. I am Joseph it is, um, it is something really, really incredible. Um, where is it? I lost it. Right here. So my Greek is better than my Hebrew because I'm a Kmart Jew. Um, so I, I went into the Septuagint, and um, there's this thing that, that happens um, in the Greek uh, occasionally with, with Jesus. Uh, we, we sort of grab hold of the divine name for God, uh, the, the name of, of Yahweh, uh, the name given uh, to Moses when he asks, uh, who should I say is giving me these, these things? And God says, tell them I am sent you. Um, in the Greek, the word to be uh, is, is parsed, so you can actually just say one word that says I am. But Jesus, to, to emphasize the great I am that is Lord in the Bible, in the Old Testament you're reading, and it's Lord all in capital letters, but they're little capital letters, that's, that's the divine name, that's Yahweh, uh, that's the I am. Um, it, it was a name so holy nobody should speak it in, in um, Judaism. Um, Joseph doubles up on it, and he says, Ego emi, Joseph. I am. I, I am, Joseph. That I am, Joseph. And he gives us, gives us something really cool hap that, that, that would happen. Um, he, he shows us a, 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 an archetype for Christ. He, he shows us uh, that, I don't know, if there happened to be a story uh, about somebody who were cast down into a pit only to be raised up again for the salvation of, of all who would trust in him, that that, that might be a, a theme to expect from this kind of God. Um, Jesus has a number of these statements uh, throughout, especially the Gospel of John, but, but other places as well. Um, but, but Jesus will say things like, I am the bread of life. And, and it's not just I am, but I, I am. Ego em me, the bread of life. I, I am the light of the world. Uh, before Abraham was, I am. Uh, that's, that's Jesus' horrible, horrible grammar um, in John 8, 58. Um, not, not I was, I am. Uh, and then the Pharisees that he's, he's saying this to pick up stones to throw at him. But he hid himself and went out of the temple. Recognize this. This is, this is uh, Jesus claiming to be God. That's what, that's what it was when he said, Ego emi, I, I am. Um, see, they didn't pick up stones to throw at him because he said he's old. They picked up stones to throw at him because he said he's the name of the unspeakable God. He is God made flesh here for sinners to redeem they couldn't handle that. Um, when Jesus lays hold of, of uh, th this language, it's a revelation uh, of his divinity. So when he tells us things like, I am the door, I am the good shepherd, I am the resurrection and the life, I am the way and the truth and the life, I am the vine, listen. Because Jesus is not just sort of revealing himself to be a plant, but he's revealing himself to be the God that by uh, being attached to, we would have life. Um, when he says, I am, I am the resurrection and the life, he tells us the very character of God. It's not just that he is Jesus who will die and rise again, but he is God who would die and rise again because the character of God is to save sinners through death and resurrection. The character of God is to be the good shepherd who would gather up the sheep. The character of God uh, who, who is to be true and life, uh, the path of, of, of sinners. And, and it gets carried forward, too. Um, even in Acts 9, as, as uh, Jesus uh, speaks to Saul becoming Paul along the way, um, he says, I am Jesus who you are persecuting. 
This is, um, this is such a wonderful news that anybody who would live by the law considers it profane. It, it, it's such a wonderful revelation that if you want to live by the law and your works, it's, 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 it's like nails on the chalkboard. Um, because all you have, all you have is a present God to work mercy. <laughs> and that's Jesus. That's what Joseph says. I am Joseph. I, I am Joseph. And he wants them to hear it too. I remember last time Pastor Fanker mentioned, you know, up until this time, um, Joseph, to kind of keep the prank going, to, you know, make sure, I don't know, maybe they wouldn't recognize him, he never actually addresses his brothers in Hebrew. He speaks to them through an interpreter in Egyptian uh, to, to kind of further the ruse. Um, notice, though, he, he sends them away. Uh, Make everyone go away from me. No one was with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. He doesn't speak to his brothers in Egyptian anymore, but he speaks to them in their own native language, the, the language that they spoke to each other when they were growing up together, uh, the, the, the language that God would reveal himself uh, through the prophets by. He speaks to them in, in, in the, the language, Hebrew, that, that God would actually speak peace um, to, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, and now through Joseph to his brothers. I, I am. This is, this is not just sort of, uh, look, look who I am, it's me all along, the ripping off of the mask, the pointing at the camera. This is a revelation of how God is always at work to save people. Um, it, it, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, it, it leaves only hope behind. And it sort of, again, flavors the name Joseph. Um, when, when Joseph is named, uh, remember um, why. Um, that that uh, his mom wants more kids. <laughs> Joseph is, he will add. Maybe he will add to me another son, the Lord. Um, may the Lord add to me another son. Joseph, it's great that you're here, but also more, please. Um, that's, that's not a happy picture to be raised under. Um, but at the same time, he becomes the means by which more is given. Um, his descent into the pit and his ascension from it, his, his death and resurrection... Uh, become the means of the salvation of um, the lineage um, of, of all the faithful of his family um, and and in the same way Jesus descent um, and, and ascension Jesus death and resurrection is the means of our salvation Joseph is the way that our Lord would add and in the same way Jesus is, is the the way that our Lord would add if you want to look for where our God's uh, mercy is where he's adding to you uh, you can do it in terms of money you can do it in terms of power and you're always going to mess it up uh, because our Lord makes the sun shine on good and evil alike and so if just the people who have money are the ones that God loves uh, what do you do with um, all the I don't know the widows who cry to him in faith and um, hope in the gospels uh, what do you do when I don't know you happen to be a pastor and you don't have lots of money um, what do you do with the godless men who seem to have a lot of it well, we say God died for them, and he gives gifts not to those who have earned it, but to sinners, because he wants to redeem and save sinners, and he wants to call all to the knowledge of this truth. Instead of measuring God's mercy by what he adds in terms of stuff, look at how he adds to his brothers. It's through death and resurrection. Look at how Jesus adds to us. It's a salvation. It's through death and resurrection. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, so, so... When, when Joseph says, um, I am, there's a lot of cool stuff going on here. It, it's wonderful. Um, and uh, so let's keep going here. Um, there's a parallel um, between this two um, in the revelation of the identity. Uh, think about how Jesus reveals himself uh, after the resurrection in the locked room to Thomas. Um, that, that when Jesus shows up, uh, everybody freaks out. And what's, what's he have to say to them? peace be with you. Um, what about when Jesus is walking on water and they think it's a ghost? Do not be afraid, it is I. See, apart from the revelation of God's identity, there's never any hope in what he's doing. Unless Joseph actually gives the identity, I, I am Joseph, all of this thing is cruel. But all of a sudden, it, it is, it is um, that dream being enacted. He, he's not just better than his brothers and they have to subject themselves to him. But he is the, the, the Christ figure. He is the means of their salvation. 
He is the picture uh, of Jesus who, who would, um, we would bow to, who is better than us, but who would humble himself that we would be saved. Um, but when God's revelation is added to these things, all of a sudden there can be hope. If there's just a weird guy walking on water, it's a ghost. If there's just all of a sudden another guy in the room after you lock the doors, you're being robbed. But if it's Jesus, he tells you and he brings peace. What we see inside of this too is, is um, where, where God's uh, work is, is um, both alien and proper. Um, God's alien work um, is affliction. God's proper work is comfort. God's alien work, his, his weird work, the work that he's not super comfortable with. It, it's affliction. Um, because why does God afflict but to drive us to himself? We talked about the way that God would test us, not to see what we would do, but so that we would see what he would do. God tests us, not so that he would learn about us, so that we would learn about him. God afflicts us, not because he is, is perverse in, in watching us suffer, but because he wants to suffer for us and drive us only to the cross of Christ where there is forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation, not in our works, but in his. Um, and so it changes how we preach to people who are suffering. The sermon to people suffering is never, you deserve it because you're a sinner and also you deserve worse, so you should be thankful that it's not worse because if God were going to go through all of your sins, well, you should be in hell right now, so be thankful that you're not ingrate instead. I hope nobody's preached that. Instead, why don't we preach baptism? You are united in your baptism to Christ in his death, and you are certainly united to him in his resurrection. Yeah, crosses hurt, but Jesus' cross for you, the one that you are tied to right now that hurts, is also the path to life. Because yeah, it's no fun to be buried with him in the grave, but three days later you know what's coming. So even now in this affliction, understand who your God is. Because you're never going to figure out why. There's never any comfort in why. Why is there all of a sudden an extra guy in the locked room? Why is there all of a sudden a guy walking on water? Why are we being pranked with this stolen cup? Why? We can't understand because God is smarter than us. If we could perfectly understand God, we'd need a better God. You cannot work the internet. You need help. You need God. Instead, look to who. Who is where all of the comfort is? Jesus says, it is I, Jesus. Joseph says, it is I. I, I am Joseph. Um, and in this, all of the comfort comes flooding in. So in the middle of your affliction, no, you're never going to understand why sometimes. Sometimes afterwards you'll figure it out. But a lot of times, even in the middle, especially in the middle of it, when you need to know, you're not going to know. So instead, remember who. Who is your God? Yours is the God who has died and rose for you. Yours is the God who comes into the mess and brings peace. Yours is the God who works life and salvation, not for those who deserve it, but who he loves. And then you can start to see mortification of the flesh for what it is. Because there's a big push for talk about mortification of the flesh that ain't, ain't suffering so grand. But here's the thing, mortification of the flesh apart from the gospel is just called death. That doesn't help anybody. Mortification of the flesh, in other words, the, the sort of the crucifying of the old Adam is of no use unless the new man is first risen from the dead. So, man, we, we, should, we should really be looking there. I don't know. It, it, it shapes the phrase, uh, the praise, excuse me. One last question uh, as we sort of wrap this thing up because we're coming up on time. Joseph said to his brothers, I, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? He already knew. Like the whole time they were talking about his dad. The whole time they were like, no, remember we just said if we don't bring Benjamin home, he will die. If he, he will die, he's not dead yet. He, he's asking about something he already knows about. Um, he wants them to have the chance to respond with good news back. He wants them to have the chance to praise. This is what praise is. Praise isn't coming up with something brand new on your own. It's singing back to God the good news that God has already united the family, that God has already restored the family. You know that thing I just did? Tell me about it. It's great. Um, praise is a reflection upon what God speaks first. Praise isn't, you know, from our hearts and how we feel. Because, well, even as uh, he asked them, the brothers could not answer him for they were dismayed at his presence. It's going to come. It's going to come. They're going to get their heads around it. But right now, uh, anytime somebody yells, bro, it's just a prank, you're usually not having fun at that moment. Um, but, but in love, we can actually be brought closer together. And hate will be driven farther apart. So don't prank strangers. Um, that, that's not good. Um, instead, um, mess with your loved ones. Um, in, instead, when we 
when we actually have a, a, such a joy and such a love and such a comfort with one another, such a certainty of forgiveness uh, that, that we can actually play with each other a, and we can actually have fun with each other. So that um, every, every time um, we've got this, we've got this uh, thing on our sink with a little hose, the psh hose, so you can you can wash the dishes um, when when they're not like right under the water. You can like lift it up and you can be like psh. Um, you can also put a rubber band on it so when somebody turns on the water, it's like, psh. Um, don't do that to strangers. Do that to your loved ones. But also don't do that to your parents because there's a fourth commandment. Um, anyway, uh, praise though. Praise. A reflection of what God speaks first. Um, Joseph reveals to them the, the, the mercy of God, the dream coming true for their good. And then he asks them to tell, me about, tell him about how he has preserved their father. Give them good news to speak back. He, he, he sets them up. Here's the tea. Just, just swing at it. And in all of it, um, God is, is always at work to, to actually let this dream not simply be a who's greater than and who's less than, but a how is God working. Um, so that, that would be uh, Genesis 44 to 45 verse 3. Uh, I guess we'll be picking back up here soon because I'm out of time. Thank you for letting me substitute uh, again, please keep Pastor Borghart and his family and all of those affected by the hurricane in your prayers. Uh, Pastor's okay, uh, but I know there's been some flooding in his office. Um, I, I, uh, I, I know that they are, are working to clean things up, but um, at the same time, the storm uh, throughout Louisiana has done a lot of damage. And so even inside of this affliction, again, remember who is your God. Uh, and here speak comfort. Uh, yours is the God who has conquered death. Yours is the God who stills the storm. And yours is the God who actually stands in the middle of it to be with those who are suffering inside of it. Uh, ours is the Christ, the Son of the living God. May you have peace in his name. Amen.